<laughs> Emil Brunner said there's only one question which is really serious, and that's the question concerning the being and nature of God. From this, all other questions derive their significance. Uh, it's the fundamental question of all of life. Realize that there are at least, there, there are probably more, but these are the ones I think we really need to make sure we know. There are at least six ways God reveals himself. We haven't talked about this, have we? No. Okay. At least six ways. He does it through words. He talks to people. Um, direct speech. The prophets hear the voice of God. The prophets are this this word from God. And scripture is a way God has spoken to us in words. God reveals himself through attributes. He says, I'm gracious, I'm merciful, I'm wrathful, I'm loving, I'm powerful. He actually gives us descriptive attributes so we know his character. We know God as he reveals himself through what he does. He creates, he judges, he opens the ground and swallows people and closes it behind them. He, he makes covenants. He redeems. Uh, he, he does all kinds of things. And every time we see God do something in the Bible, we need to ask, what do we learn about God from this action? He reveals himself in images. He says, I'm a, I'm a consuming fire. He says, I'm the rock. He, say, he, he guides it his people by a cloud or a pillar of fire. He gives images of himself. What's the ultimate image of God? Christ, yes. He is the image of the invisible God. He is a, uh, Jesus Christ, the man in his human nature, is a created thing that is an image to show us who God is. Now, he's fully God at the same time, which distinguishes him from every other image, but that is the ultimate image God gives us of himself, the, the ultimate ability to see him. <clears throat> um, he has titles. He's the father. He's the king, the shepherd, the warrior. Lots of titles we could think about. And finally, names. Yahweh and uh, El Kanai. He says, my name is Jealous. He is El Shaddai, God Almighty. And of course, the name Jesus Christ for God. Um, these six ways are so helpful for us to uh, understand the way God is revealing himself. Now realize that they are all ways God reveals the one true God to us. Yes. Blepo. Love that word. One of my favorite Greek words. Oh, these are all good. Um, 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 <clears throat> So we have the one true God, and we don't get different gods revealed to us with these different means, but these are perspectival revelations. They are getting God's nature across to us with these different perspectives, and they serve different purposes. And I hope as we read through these, you recognized immediately, wow, there's tremendous overlap between these ways of revealing. And actually, did you get, the, as we were reading through these, were you saying, well, wait, he reveals himself in words, in titles, but isn't a title a word? Yep. And he reveals himself in attributes, but as soon as you think of an attribute, don't you immediately think of an image? Yep. And when you think of an image, doesn't that point you to an attribute? Yep. That's the point. There's, there's tons of overlap in these, and they do hit different aspects of who we are. Images tend to hit us at a emotive level more than an attribute, right? Um, names have a very personal element to them. Uh, these are so important to understand and to understand the necessary and unavoidable overlap between these things. Titles lead you to think of images, which lead you to think of attributes, which are all communicated in words uh, and then can make you think about a name. So, so there's a lot of overlap, but it's helpful to think about the distinct ways God does reveal himself. Often he'll do six of these in one passage. Um, but it's so important to anchor them, in my opinion, in attributes. The way we approach this course, I don't know if you know this, but the way we approach this course is perceived by some to be horribly limiting to God because it's oriented around which of these six? Attributes. 
we could do an entire course, and I'm so tempted to do it sometimes, around the images of God. Do a whole course just thinking about the images of God. Wouldn't that be amazing? So, why do I refrain and orient the course around attributes, do you think? And this, this is horribly uh, criticized at times, this approach we have as, as terribly uh, enlightenment, propositional, western, white man way of doing theology that is horribly limiting to God, and it's Aristotelian, and it just gets all kinds of criticism. Um, even, even among some emergent church leaders, the approach we're taking to this course would be seen as, oh, you are so in bondage to the Enlightenment, being held hostage by, by the Enlightenment. So, uh, I don't think that's true. Why, why do you think it may make sense to orient our study of God's character with an appreciation of all six, but with a focus on attributes? Yeah, if you've been hit in the head by a rock. Yeah, sure. As I have, as you can probably see in the scars. Yeah. Um, yeah, rock. Okay. I am the rock, God says. Sadly, that brings that terrible actor to mind, right? But, uh, <laughs> great example, right? Is the, is, are you supposed to think about Dwayne? That's his name, right? Are you supposed to make, think about Dwayne when God says, I'm the rock? I hope not. Now, what will keep you from thinking about Dwayne or something that is unfeeling? Something that is unthinking? Liz? If you bring that image back to an attribute. Yes, good. Good. Yes, yes, yes. And incorporate the other attributes. Because... Uh, how about titles? Father. Wow. You want to talk about something that, especially these days, could lead you so astray. What was your father like? Is that what God's like? And how often do you hear people say, it's really hard for me to trust God, love God, uh, because my father gave me a really bad example of that. Well, what do we do then? Yeah, bring it back to attributes. I think, I think it's necessary to ground our study of the character of God in the attributes of God. They are this objective, definitional description of God that then helps us understand all of the names, titles, images, actions, and words in light of who He says He is. And that's why I have you memorizing these. Wouldn't it be great to have character of God part two? where we, we dive into all these images once we really get these attributes anchored in our minds. So they're anchored and not flying around based on whatever our experiences of these images or titles or names are. So, um, and because it, actually it's hard enough to get the, the attributes right. Because even those attributes carry with it all sorts of wrong ideas. So you think of the jealousy of God and you think of all horrible human examples of that. So it's hard enough to take a word like jealous or angry and get it right. Or love for that matter. We, we've seen how important it is and how difficult it is to even understand an attribute like love properly. And so before we start gravitating toward images... And this idea that this is just a rationalistic, enlightenment way of thinking about it, and, and postmodernism is pushing us away from clear definitions of God's character and to a very image-oriented approach to understanding God. And if that's not anchored in the attributes of God, we're in big trouble because God will end up looking just like us. It's always what happens. Just study history, you know, Albert Schweitzer, you know the... 1800s were this age and the early 1900s were, uh, yeah, it, yeah, hundreds were this age of writing lives of the historical Jesus. You know about this? Where people were saying, you know, there's this Christ of faith. That's the one we believe in. Let's get behind the Christ of faith and find the Jesus of history, they would call it. The, the real rabbi back there who, who it doesn't have all this imposition, imposed apostolic, theology on top of him. Who was Jesus really? 
And so people started writing histories of the lives of the historical Jesus. And there are hundreds out there. One of my profs at Wheaton, Walter Elwell, read every one of them. Because that's what he did his dissertation. He, he could read a book a day easily. So it's not that big of a deal, I guess, for him. But um, he read every one of them. And, and Schweitzer read them, read most of them. And he, he concluded after reading them that these historians, as he put it, looked down into the well of history and saw their own reflection. And so these Jesus images that came out of them look a lot like these historians. And it's amazing if you study these lives of Jesus that, you know, the ones written by Americans are these rugged individualists, you know. And, and, and whatever culture the person came out of ended up producing a Jesus that looked just like them. Uh, so, realize God's actions are grounded in his nature. Uh, look at this great combination here in Psalm 86.10. For you are great. So we affirm his greatness. And then I love this. And do wondrous things. You alone are God. Now, I don't want to ever draw us a false separation between who God is and what he does. I think in an effort to correct uh, the way we tend to do things, you can go too far. Because we tend to think about what God does way more than who God is. And we find out who God is by what He does. And who He is leads Him to do what He does. And so we, we don't draw a false dichotomy here, but we do need to anchor our understanding of God and who He is in His nature before we run after what He does all the time. Because what he does is always rooted in who he is. So you are great, I love that, and do wondrous things. See, the Bible makes a distinction here and grounds things in who he is. Psalm 119, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Do you see that? This affirmation of who God is in his being, and then you take the step of affirming what he does out of his being. Uh, there's a little bit of an artificiality to it, but it's so helpful at times when you pray, when you worship, privately, corporately, to force yourself as an exercise to pray to God, to worship God, focusing on exclusively who He is. It's really hard to do, and, and there's a, an artificiality to it. Because the Bible constantly does this. You are great and do wondrous things. You are good and do good. And so, so the Bible will anchor who, our understanding of God and a response to God based on who He is, but then quickly get to what He does. But it's almost like we need a corrective. And I think of this all the time, and sometimes you can get it wrong, but wise ministers, wise leaders, wise disciples of Jesus realize, all right, where am I? Where are we as a church, as a culture? And so then, what do we need to do as correctives? You know, if, um, if your elbow's not in or your jump shot, you gotta force it in even to an extreme, right? What, what would you do in swimming to correct an error? You got an example of something like that? And yeah, you overcompensate. You certain, yeah, you do certain drills. Yeah, where you overcompensate, you exaggerate a move because you're neglecting it, right? Uh, and so, would, isn't there one drills where you sort of pull up w in ways you never actually would, right? So we need to think about those things theologically too, and spiritually too, and say, what are areas of our character, of our understanding of God, of our Christian lives, that are, are emaciated and neglected, and then what should we do to overcompensate to correct that error? It, and it's, it's like a piece of paper. You know, if, if if I want this paper to stand up straight, I, I, I'm, but if it's bent, right? If it's prone to do that, it's not gonna be enough. It, it's just gonna keep falling back. So sometimes we need to do that, right? And then it's gonna be right. It'll stand up straight. And, and our theology can be that way too. The problem though is sometimes people do this, right? And then they got a, a warp in the other direction. They've, they've got a, a misunderstanding of the other direction. And, and so, um, you know what they say, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
Um, <laughs> and so it, sometimes in your efforts to overcorrect, you don't then end up balanced. You, you end up unbalancing. You all fall off the other side of the horse. Uh, and so we need to think of attributes of God and ways we approach God that have been greatly neglected. And so for a time, maybe we need to, need to overcompensate from how we would normally would be to the point where we're finally balanced. Does that make sense? Liz. Can you give us like an example? Like, are you talking about God's attributes? Like people that focus a lot on like the grace and they forget about wrath and might and hugeness of God. So they focus a lot on personal. Yeah, and then sure. And they overcorrecting. Like, yep. Okay. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I think also like one of the most helpful for me is when people see the cross like the cross can be something that's like an idol almost because we're so concerned about what it accomplishes for us huh. but not realizing like the ends of that accomplishment is the relationship. <laughs> so we'll see like the intermediary work of Christ hmm. like as like this, oh, I'm forgiven, I get to go to heaven yeah. and get all these good things and it's like, but there's an end to that if that was revealing something. That right. Was I mean, what did we see when we looked at First John 4 a couple weeks ago when we were defining the love of God? What is the cross in 1 John more than anything else? It's, yes, this thing that accomplishes our salvation, but what is it primarily in 1 John 4? It's the, dis what's that? It does that, yes, but it, it, so it's a display of the wrath of God. The cross is a display of the wrath of God. And what? This is what love is, right? And love, so first and foremost, this action of God sending His Son and the Son going to the cross is a display of the character of God that leads to worship, not just because of what we, what we get out of it, but because of what we see of God there. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I think grounding things in the attributes of God, that's why, guys, what you're doing in this assignment to get ready for that exam next week is so vital because it will help you See all that God does and all the images and the names and the titles and the words anchored in these definitions because now you've exhausted the character of God. No, obviously not. Because you even have a, a really solid understanding of that attribute. No, but you've got the necessary starting point. But do we camp there so much that, that that's everything? Or can we back up and say, and actually, Edwards in the religious, religious Affections, when he talks about what it means to truly have experienced the work of God, it is this, this deep love for the beauty of his perfections that would love him even if you were still going to hell. And see, that's, that's a hypothetical, but it's a helpful, it's, it's this. It's saying, okay, what if, what if he didn't save you? What then? Would you still see him as altogether worthy? Because you know what? He didn't have to. His character put him under no compulsion to save you. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of David in the Psalms. Yes. He just yeah. Pushed, Good. So free. Or even Job. Though he Job. slay me. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. There's this overemphasis that needs a corrective sometimes. And it, it can't, it, there is an artificiality to it because one of the primary ways he reveals himself is by what he does and the cross is a display of these actions. Yes, but, but there can be a helpful uh, over, uh, 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 correction because of an overcorrection. We need to be careful with it, it needs wisdom. But. I was just wondering if or how that, that pattern of overcompensation you're talking about ever, ever really stops. Because it seems like if you were aiming to um, you know, focus more on God's wrath so that you don't forget about grace or something else like and goodness is obscured or something like that. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like less of a, a two-sided horse than like a 35-sided horse. You know. Yeah, but that's why we need to, I have a friend who keeps a pendulum on his desk and whatever he's talking about, he realizes that our tendency is to be these pendulum swingers. And so as he's thinking about what's going on in his own heart or a relationship or a controversy going on in his ministry or, or what's going on at home with his son or his wife. He swings this pendulum and he watches it just trying to think about, okay, where are we on this pendulum swing? Um, and everybody says, well, be balanced. No, that's not realistic because if you always try to be balanced, you're not going to be appreciating this pendulum swing tendency. Um, heaven will be balanced. In the meantime, 
truly wise ministers with any prophetic voice realize the blind spot. That's why whenever I get to somebody in a different culture, I always say, okay, you've been in America a little while, tell me, where are we on this pendulum swing? What, where are blind spots? What are we missing here? Because we're immersed in it, we can't even tell. What are we missing? Where are we on this pendulum swing? Because we wanna, we wanna try it as much as we can to get it back to where it needs to be. That's a great point. And, and so much depends on your temperament. Some of us are inclined to like things about God more than others just because of our personality, right? Or the, the examples we had of people who have that attribute and it didn't work out very well. Um, or, or what our church background was like. Or uh, what, what our cultural experience has been. Uh, our fam what our family experience has been. You know, every time I preach, I think, okay, where are we in the pendulum in light of what I'm preaching on right now? Is, uh, is our greatest problem legalism or is it sin all the more so grace may abound? Are we Corinth or Galatia? I don't know, which is it? And everybody's a mixture of both and we're sitting out there. And, and, and so you, you always need to think, all right, what does it mean to realize where we are and then speak truth into that situation? That's a great challenge of ministry. Isn't like C.S. Lewis talked about reading old books for that reason? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, he says we need that fresh sea breeze to come in and clear out the cobwebs that have, have formed and, and that inability we have to even see who we are now. And, and that's why, yeah, if all you read is modern stuff, you'll never get that beautiful perspective. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Um, you know, let's, let's stay along this line. Uh, when we think about who God is, uh, we, we come at Him, understanding Him from these different perspectives. But if you go to your definitions in your course pack, to page, where are those definitions? Um, yeah, look, yeah, 17. Look at number five. God's attributes are not divided into parts, yet we see different attributes emphasized at different times. This is such a vital teaching. God's attributes are unified. One of the reasons I love, pipe, uh, love um, the Tozer book is because he brings that up all the time, doesn't he? Seems like he can't talk about one attribute without saying, but make sure you consider it in light of the other attributes and see them interdependently functioning all the time. All the time. Guys, this is one of those ways God is so different than we are that we need to understand this. Uh, and work at understanding this. And this is one of the most beautiful things about God. I worship Him in response to His unity all the time. Um, all right. well, I was going to say, uh, Piper brings up a lot. Yes, he yeah. He talks about, he uses more of the term like schizophrenic God, uh -huh. which I kind of liked because there is this tendency to like see judgment and then also see desire to save. Yes, and yeah. And you just kind of get like, what's this weird like, yep. vision? And so I liked that he kept using like, that's not God, you know, he's yes. complex, but also unified. Yes. It's all coming together. Yeah, the, as soon as the book I'm working on now is done, and then the two after that, <laughs> I'll probably be dead, but the one after that <laughs> is going to be called The Kindness and Severity of God, The Unity of God in the Scriptures, because it is so prevalent in the Bible. Like that hymn, that you, you have mercy and power put side by side. And, and we tend not to acquaint those things, but yeah, it's so important. And so we recognize that God um, is perfectly unified in His attributes. And that means interdependence all the time, anytime we think about any attribute. And so God is love. And he is also wise. And you really want that, don't you? You really want a God who is not just loving, but wise in his love. Have you ever tried to love somebody and not known how to do it? Well, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. God's love is always wise love. I have so often in my life been truly loving and stupidly so. And God is never lacking wisdom in his love. And he's wise, you can be wise and unloving. He's wise and loving. And isn't it good to know 
that he is all powerful. Because if his love were only wise, that wouldn't be good enough, would it? You can know exactly how to love people. You can be entirely loving toward them. And if you don't have the ability to accomplish the good that your wise love would have accomplished, well, then who cares? And that's not God's love. So loving, powerful, wise love is a wonderful thing. And he better have knowledge. <laughs> wow, that came out as an entirely different, it's not even a word. Um, he, he's completely knowledgeable. He's, he's omniscient. He has complete knowledge. And that means his wisdom never lacks any knowledge. Isn't that great? Because you can be wise, but just not have all the information you may need to make the best decision. And so wisdom filled with complete knowledge is a wonderful thing. Imagine if God were powerful, but not loving. <gasps> That's really bad. I don't know which is worse, power without love or love without power. We need them both, and it better be wise, and it better have all the information you need. And because he never lacks any knowledge, he never does the wise thing that just needed a little more info. That's a wonderful affirmation. So he's, he's wise and powerful and loving, and he's just. He always does what's morally right, according to the, word, the, the law that he's given. He's always just. That flows from his character. So his love is always just. So I believe people genuinely want to love in this culture, but they often do it in ways that are horribly unjust or unwise or un, uh, unloving, uh, uh, un, uh, lacking the power to do it. So do you see where we're going here? Grace. His love is gracious. His power is gracious power. His grace is powerful. Uh, think about holiness. That all of, all of these attributes are holy, and His holiness is loving and gracious and fully knowledgeable. And wise. Is that great? And we could just go on and on and on. So uh, it weren't, wouldn't be enough, would it, if He weren't omnipresent? <laughs> wouldn't it be horrible if He were all these things but just not around? <laughs> wouldn't that be really bad or in half the world or one person at a time no that would be horrible that wouldn't be God that wouldn't be enough that's not what we need well how about wrath isn't it good to know that his love isn't some sappy sentimental unjust love no it's love so strong that it hates whatever is in opposition to what is loved and then uses that power and grace and wisdom to do something about it. Uh, so you're getting the point, yeah? We could go on and on with this. The second half of the definition of unity is that we see different attributes emphasized at different times. And so maybe that's seeing one of the colors. But the whole time you see that color, you need to know uh, that this is entirely interdependent on on all his other attributes. So this, guys, is a holistic way of thinking about God. What we so often wrongly fall into is, um, it's been called by Roger Nicole, the pedal theory of God's attributes. If you had me for Theology One, you've heard this. Um, but the pedal theory uh, considers attributes in independently of one another. Money? Money? Where? Money. Oh, mercy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, God has all the money he needs, but uh, that's not an attribute. But uh, yeah, mercy. So, so we fall into, first because we're finite creatures, and especially if you're a man, you can't think about more than one thing at a time. Uh, women, maybe five or eight, but, but uh, even that's so limiting. But we're finite, and then we do have these, 
these cultural, uh, personal, church, family inclinations that cause us to do this, right? And we end up living fixated on an attribute at a time, right? And we live there. And what we, we desperate come here, Wes. What we desperately need is is one another, and th especially those from other cultures, I keep putting in Liz because she's an ICS major, right? From other cultures, no, no, I know you're not from another culture, but yeah, you study other cultures. So if Wes is just fixated, say, on the jealousy of God, right? I need to come along and say, Wes, consider God in all his wholeness, right? This is how you need to think of him, right? And, and what's beautiful is it, it, it works both ways, right? And you should actually marry somebody who's inclined to focus on different ones than you and go to church. Yeah, you're good. Um, thank you. So we pull each other back and say, look at God big picture. Uh, because think about what it means. To, uh, so I spent three years of my life studying and writing on the jealousy of God. That can be distorting, right? Although, because there's such a need of a corrective there, I wasn't too concerned because I had nothing until then in my understanding of jealousy. And so there was such a desperate need and I was seeing how vacuous an understanding of jealousy was uh, among God's people that I wasn't concerned. Although my readers in, in that, those three years kept saying, Eric, keep backing up, back up. Don't, how, do you, how are you gonna work God's love into this? Don't give people the impression that that's all God is, even though it's a corrective. And so here's the problem. Uh, you tell me, if you slip into the pedal theory, what are the implications of that? What happens? Yeah, you neglect his attributes. Good. It's separate. And they're not you, you know, and it's they're separate. Yeah, and they're it's so distorting. Yeah. Right, right. Instead of seeing him as a whole. Yes, yes. So because we tend to be so independent in, in the way we experience emotions and attributes and attitudes and actions that we tend to think, well, if God's going to open up that wrath valve before he does that, he needs to shut that grace valve. Mm -hmm. Shut off that supply of mercy so he can open up that justice valve. Right. And let that justice flow. Right. <laughs> We, that's how we think, that you've got to stop one supply for the other opposite thing to happen. And what ends up happening is not only do you have a distorted view of God, you have a distorted view of every single attribute. Do you see how that works? It's not just that we lose a good, robust, holistic understanding of the character of God. We don't even have an accurate understanding of one thing about Him. Because our love isn't completely informed by His justice. Our understanding of holiness isn't completely informed by His, his imminence. And so we've got to do everything we can, as much as finite creatures can, to constantly back up and see God in His holistic nature. So this course is called the character of God, not the attributes of God, because I don't want you thinking of separate things in a list. Although I give that to you and make you memorize it, big picture, we need to constantly back up. And when you memorize all of them, hopefully you'll get this holistic interde interdependent understanding of His attributes. So let's brainstorm. What are ways we can be more holistic in our understanding of God? More, more uh, getting away from the pedal theory, which is a road to disaster. What do we do? What, what are things we can be doing to, to be more and more holistic in our understanding of God's attributes? Yes, good. Fellowship, this vital, vital way we, we learn to appreciate aspects of God through other people's experience of Him. That's why we sit around in this class and say, tell us what you think about God. How, how have you learned who He is? Tell us what He's used in your life. Well, that's never happened to me, but I just gained from it. That's beautiful. Yes, we need each other to understand things about God we wouldn't left to ourselves. Good, so fellowship is a vital way. And as much as you can, fellowship with people different than you. 
Um, not that they, they're Buddhist and you're learning, but, but people who have a different personality, people who are at a different stage in life, different culture, different race, different socioeconomic status. Don't ever go to church and hang out with, with another 20 year old. That's your one chance a week to go find an 80 year old lady and say, tell me what you think about God. The last thing you need is a college group. You are a college group. You live in a college group. Goodness. These, for, so for two hours a week, you have to be with other 20-year-olds. You can't get away from them. D don't talk to your roommate or anybody from, by, uh, from, from your campus. Go find a little kid, somebody with disability, somebody to go talk to who's so different than you are and say, tell me, tell me how you think about God. Um, be that kind of person. So, uh, you know, that's... That's why fellowship and things like multiculturalism are so important. I hate the fact that that's become a buzzword that we do because the culture says we have to. Hate that. that no, we do it because we want to know God and all of his depth and richness. And we got blind spots. Uh, so we desperately need one another. And not people just like you. You actually need people very different than you to learn the most. So uh, interdependence, not pedal theory, uh, so that we can understand. What else? What else do we do? Yes. What portions? Yeah. We need to be whole Bible Christians. I think I've told you, I've, I've uh, asked my Theology One students, how many have read the whole Bible? And it's less than 20%. I've read the entire Bible. What's it going to do to your understanding of God? And, and we, we focus on certain portions of Scripture at the expense of others. Yes, it takes great patience and hard diligence to get through Leviticus with attentiveness. But you need to do it. You need to do it. Did I ever tell you the story about the way God used Leviticus in a friend's life? He had a prof when he was in college who talked about the fear of the Lord and grieving over our sin. And he said, you, you really need to understand those two things. And Chris went up to him after class and said, I don't think I really get the fear of the Lord and grieving over my sin. Sorrow for sin. I'm not sure I get it. And so he said, what should I do? And this guy said, take a year and study Leviticus intensely. Fear the Lord and sorrow for sin will be the result. <laughs> and Chris said, really? Not what I was looking for. And he didn't get around to it. He just didn't do it when he was in college and for a couple years after. And then he went to become an, a, a missionary in India with his wife. And he was a missionary in India and he said, you know, I'm going to do an intense study in Leviticus here. Now that I'm in India and I have a little time and, uh, and I'm going to do this. And so he, he was four months into the, the year-long study he was going to do. And God was so impressing on him. His holiness, God's holiness, his hatred of sin and the massive need for atonement that Leviticus presents, that, that Chris had no ability to do anything about himself. And God was just pounding away at his sense of holiness and the sacrificial system. And, and he was studying it to the point where he realized that there is an entire plumbing system. Do you know this under the temple to handle the, the massive flow of blood during the sacrificial times? I mean, it was anything but clean and tidy. It's amazing what we demand in our worship environments now. But um, so Chris is being just immersed in this. And he went for a, he had a, some friend come and visit when he was in India. And he and his wife... Julie, went for a walk through this village they were living in in India. And on this walk, they walked in front of a butcher shop. And in butcher shops in India, most of them, they just slaughter the animals right in front of you and then hang them up to drip. Um, and Chris and his friend and Julie walked by this butcher shop just as the butcher put a goat in a headlock and slit its throat. And the blood just came flying out and the thing started to gurgle and make these horrible sounds. And, and they saw this in all Chris had been studying in Leviticus, just dumped on him like a dump truck. 
And he said, I was overwhelmed with the holiness of God and my sin, and I couldn't handle it. And he said, I just began to weep and shake. And I turned to my friend and my wife and I said, I need to leave. And he said, and I took off running as fast as I could away from that butcher shop. His friend thought he'd lost his mind. Julie knew exactly what had just happened. She wasn't studying Leviticus with him, but she knew what he was going through in that. And she knew exactly what had just happened. And Chris said he thinks he ran for about an hour. He just, he said, I, the streets were filthy. There was dirt everywhere. And he said, I felt far more filthy than anything else in those gutters. And, and he said he just, he, ran, he physically tried to run away from what he had just seen. And God did a work in Chris's life. And the way Chris describes it is, ever since that moment, I've always been homesick. He, he understands his sin, the sin in this world, to the point where he, he wants to get home. And if you knew Chris, you'd know he, he loves life. He, he loves food and life. He just loves life. He dives into it. He's a good man. He actually heads up the C.S. Lewis Center at Wheaton. Um, he's a C.S. Lewis expert. But in that experience actually has helped him to understand Lewis, who talked so much about the Shadowlands, how this world is not what it's going to be. And so uh, if you met Chris, you would always, there's a brokenheartedness to him. You can sense immediately when you meet him and a homesickness, a faraway look in his eye. And it all gets back to those months in Leviticus. Uh, how many of us have ever immersed ourselves in a book of the Bible, especially one like Leviticus, to the point where it's able to have that sort of transformative effect when it merges with the experiences of our lives. But, but that is as important as anything in knowing God, is becoming saturated. It's a great word Gray used. Saturated in Scripture. Um, all of Scripture, whole Bible Christians, is a desperate need of the age. Where, where when you think about God, all the pages of your Bible are coming into play in your understanding. Uh, and you, so you spend your life adding pages in your mind and in your heart, your experience, uh, that weren't there before. And you fill in that, that God portfolio with all the pictures he gives us of himself in the Word. Good. We need each other. We need to be whole Bible Christians. Did God stop being just on the cross? Did he stop being wrathful on the cross? At the cross? Did, did he stop being holy? Did he say, all right, I'm going to set my holiness, my justice, my wrath aside, and rather express my grace and my mercy? You get that impression in the way we can talk and sing and, and pray even. And what happened to his wrath on the cross? It was satisfied. It was actually expressed as clearly as it's ever been. To think that the cross was only love is so wrong-headed. What in the world was it needed for if it's only love? So it, yeah, that's why people just find the cross offensive, because they find his wrath offensive. And you know, I remember when Rob Bell wrote the book about you know, moving away from a biblical view of hell. Some of the response was really disturbing to me because some people were saying, no, he's moving away from, from hell and, and that's wrong, we can't have that. And some of the response was, look, I believe in hell, I believe it's a biblical doctrine, but I just don't understand why you seem so set on making sure we don't get this. I mean, wouldn't it be better if we didn't have it? What, wouldn't you be happy? Why would you, are you happy that there's hell? Yes and no, right? Yes and no, because God is all wise. And that is what he has determined to happen. And so I want to learn to not put up with it only, but love it. Because it's an extension of his wrath and his justice and his holiness. And so, so with a tear in my eye, I want to love the wrath of God. Because one day he'll wipe away every tear including the one that comes from that. Um, 
Good. Yeah, Chris. I was going to say, just the, whatever worship music we listen to, we're shaping also. Yes. So as much as you can control it, I'm listening to different things. I have some really meaningful time spent just reading through my hymnal as much as Yes. Good. So. Good. Great point. What, what we sing teaches us in some ways more than anything else because it gets embedded. Yes. Um, and so part of it, like Ryan and I were talking yesterday about how, huh. so cool, how, how bad the, the church is at rebuke. Yeah. It was really cool because when Ryan was telling me I wasn't listening very well to him, and he had to rebuke me in love for not listening to him, <laughs> it was the coolest moment ever. Nice, Ryan. Um, <laughs> that is great. Um, but, <laughs> but, just how, but just how in rebuke, like, it's like, oh, well, loving is telling you the truth, so I just gotta give it to you, but, like, without the wisdom and then without, without the grace, like, just, yeah. like, how many of the things we, we need in each of our actions, yeah. and I just know so many people that are, like, simplified the Christian life to what ought I to do? And yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Like, yeah, the, and that shows up in even the ways we respond to people when they uh, apologize or repent to us. There, there are aspects of God we should embody, like grieving over sin, for instance, hating sin, a sense of justice. And have you ever had the experience where someone apologizes to you or repents, and you want it over with right away, quickly? You, you, you want it just done. And, you, and you'll even lie and say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, when it really did offend you. But, but you, don't, you don't even want to go there. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? That we are so bad at receiving apologies? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Don't worry about it. No, worry, it's fine. And one of the things that incenses me is um, when, when people don't let my kids apologize. I mean, one of them will steal, and I'll say, you return that and repent and say you're sorry. And people are like, oh, that's all right, you can have it, we got plenty. No! <laughs> right? No! Let her repent! Let it last a little while! <laughs> really? I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, I have a friend, Eddie, uh, lied on a, writing report, a reading report when he had Wayne Grudem at Trinity. And he, he just lied. He just sort of rationalized why he didn't get the reading done on time, and he lied, and he handed it in. And a couple of days later, he was under conviction, and he went and confessed to Grudem. And he, it was amazing. He, he confessed this in the Grudem. And he said, Grudem heard his confession and then just looked at him for like 20 seconds. And Ed said it was excruciating, right? And then he, he docked his grade, he forgave him, he was gracious. But Ed came away saying it was so strange because he actually let me repent and even left a little space, <laughs> right, for us both to feel it and grieve over it for a few seconds. Reading that Reduces to Nancy Eldridge book. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what do you mean? His book. You read that. <laughs> Oh, did Eddie? Oh, no, no, I think Grudem assigned. I don't know what he assigned for that course. But, um, um, but I just think of that example sometimes, that there are attributes that, we, that God possesses that we are uncomfortable having ourselves. You know, leave room to hate sin and let people repent. Right? It's amazing. Hmm. with the implication that it's gone immediately. Hmm. Um, hmm. Just like how if you confess to Christ, it's like it's done, it's over with immediately. And hmm. I was just wondering if you had like a comment on that. Like you're, I hear that emphasized a lot. Hmm. Like the only reason you're still having this burden is because you haven't asked for forgiveness. 
Yeah, it's, yeah. Then it'd be gone. Yeah, I think that could be true. Uh, maybe your concern is it that we can do it glibly or trivially or... So my, my thought was, do you think God ever just lets us sit in it for a little bit? Like, hmm. just make, in a way of making sure we understand. Maybe God makes us feel our sin in other ways. Well, we certainly will often feel the ramifications of our sin, even though we're completely forgiven. I mean, I, I think that's a way that even in the midst of complete forgiveness, we are reminded, even the fact that, isn't it fascinating that Jesus bears the scars even in his resurrected body? Isn't that interesting? I think he's unique in that. I don't think we'll have scars. But he keeps his. Um, and I think there's a reason for that. So he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west, but the worship around the throne is because our sins have been so completely forgiven, and that means nothing if you can't remember them in some way. Right? And so a realness to it that includes a true recognition of what you've been freed from is really important. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Um, just let's brainstorm just quickly about this. So these are some things we can do, is seek scripture and fellowship and worship and reading from the past and from, because you, you'll read this Puritan, the mortification of sin, uh, and, and you'll say, well, what planet did this guy come from? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and, and you need that. You need reading from other times and, and from different people. Uh, I just met with uh, a leader of a very large church right before I came here, and they're in transition senior pastor left and they are thinking about what it means from being go what it means to be in this phase of being a mega church and figuring out what it means to really be the church yeah. and and there are all kinds of things you can do that'll that'll cause growth but is it godly growth is it biblical kingdom growth or is it american shallow consumerism growth and in our conversation, one of the things we talked about was I believe the leaders of their church need to be willing to lose a thousand or so members um, because they, they've reoriented things in such a biblical way as opposed to the consumerism that's driven so much. So what we don't do then is take a, a, an opinion poll every time we're about to do something and say, what do you think we should do? And, you know, even here at Biola, you know, what do the students want us to cover in chapel? Well, I guess we should hear that. I guess that's important. But what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to, you know, doctors don't say, what do you think you need? <laughs> I need Snickers bars. All right, uh, here you go. Uh, no, <laughs> leaders... Uh, go to the Word and know people well enough to say, what do they need? They don't need one more series on dating. That's all youth group has been for the last 20 years, right? Um, how about a whole, whole year on the atonement? Let's do it. Or a whole Tory conference on the holiness of God? But the constant push is always, let's do something practically relevant. Let's do one on marriage and family and dating and how to buy a used car. No, it's just so, <laughs> so driven by, what do I feel like I need right now? Instead of, what do I really need? And it's not going to be what I feel like wanting a lot of times. And, and it might not be popular. Yeah. yeah. Have I told you about my friend who did a series at his church called People God Killed. Not the mega church guy, I'm sure.
<laughs> no, he, it, was, it, was, it was because of what we're talking about. He didn't want people to read their Bible for the first time and say, you've been lying to me. You haven't been telling me about the God in the Bible. He kills people. What's that all about? Um, and I'll tell you, it's ten, you, know, you got little kids, you're introduced to the Bible, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> and there can be a tendency to, to do that. And he, I think it was a six-month series on people God killed. You, I mean, have you ever heard of anything remotely like that? Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, that's, Jesus was the last one in the series. Yeah. 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 Yes. You know, I've never really talked to him about the response. I don't think it, I don't think he lost a lot of people because of the church. Not even necessarily in like congregations. Yeah. Oh, it's so. Yeah, it's so sobering. It's so so expanding to how you think about God. Yeah. I think there was an increased fear of the Lord. I mean, it's indicative of the church today. Yeah, the church that I'm talking about today. Um, yeah, great question. Um, Wait, I don't think I understand. His church. His church is oh, it's called Grace. Yeah, our, our first effort at being diverse, it's one of our ten ministry values, is unity in diversity. And our first effort at that is not having <coughs> the myriad of special interest groups that most churches have. We don't just think racial, cultural diversity. We think generational diversity. We think um, personality diversity, station in life diversity, demographic diversity. And so one of our ministry values is, is this. And, and in the explanation of it, we say the church is sadly segregated in America by race, culture, socioeconomic status. And we make that worse when we go into our segregated churches and segregate ourselves even more. And so we've got the, the, the teens, the college group, the young marrieds, the young marrieds with children. We've got the adult group. We've got the senior citizen group. We've, we've got uh, niche groups for particular sins. I go to the sexual addiction group. I go to the, the you know, there's, there's no greed group, but there should be uh, if they're going to go down that road. And so, so there are all these, we get these niche ministries that segregate us so far beyond how we're already segregated. So that's our first effort. So we don't have services, for instance, geared toward particular styles. You know, the contemporary service, traditional service. We think that is falling into this mentality. Because if you can sing together with people, you can get a lot done. Um, if an 80-year-old and an 18-year-old can sing together, that's saying a lot. So you got, you got the person in the front saying, this is so boring and slow. And you got the old guy saying, oh, what is this, a rock concert? And if they can hang in there and get to know each other and love each other and, and emphasize what's really important, that's accomplishing a ton. And so what you usually do is wave the white flag and say, all right, we're going to have you know, a service for old people, service for young people, service for people who like country music, service, and before you know it, it's personality and hobbies and interests and stylistically determined in all of this. And so, um, so that's the first major effort we have is to not give in to the homogeneous unit principle in the worship service mentality. So we're going to gear it for young, gear it for old. And church growth experts will tell you, gear it for someone who's 22. 22 is the age that church growth experts gear things toward because you're going to lose them more than anybody else. So if you get them, you'll probably get the old people too. The old people are going to leave. The young people will. So, so do what you can to keep the people who are going to leave and the other people will be there unhappy but, but there. <gasps> and actually, that's, that's where marketing is geared toward too, beyond the church. Did you know that? Marketing in America is geared toward a 22-year-old. 
So you guys are starting to leave that demographic already. <coughs> Do you think there's, there's like the myth of like, oh, you know, these are the high schoolers, they can't handle too much. And so that's why they have to like yeah. youth service and then your stuff for the adults because it's deeper preaching or whatever. Hey, have I told you about my hatred of children's menus? Have I mentioned that? Yeah, I hate children's menus. When a waitress brings me a children's menu for my children, I say, get away from me. Why do you want to demean my child and turn her away from the really good food to tater tots? <gasps> That's what we do. Because kids, kids it, it doesn't take anything for a kid to get beyond mac and cheese. I hate it when we give in to our kids and, and let them live on a steady diet of mac and cheese and hot dogs. I want my kids like they do when they came from Taiwan, eating sushi and seaweed. Somebody said, hey, how do you like homeschooling? And Caroline says yesterday, I like it. People don't make, make fun of my food here. Oh uh, yeah, because she went to school and they're like, what are you eating? And it's octopus, why? It's great. You want some? No! And people are running away. Going, See, I want kids to eat octopus, not tater tots, right? But, it, but it, I hate children's menus. You give my kid a ribeye. I want her to know what good steak tastes like, you know? But we do, we, we give people in the church children's menus and say, this will be easy for you. It won't be a stretch. It, it won't be anything you really need to reach for or takes anything for you to, to learn something new. I want my kids experiencing every taste imaginable, not the same one over and over again on the children's menu. Uh, so we can do that in the church too. We can just give a steady diet of children's menu. So yeah, I think it starts with kids. And, and that's, I think, did I show you the, the statement? Yeah, I showed you a statement that, that, that we want our kids to know about the glory of God not just be nice boys and girls. And so, yeah, I think it starts with kids. Getting back to the diversity issue, um, I think as soon as we, you start thinking stylistically in a self-conscious way, now, we're all gonna have a style, it's gonna come from where we are, we need to push ourselves beyond it, but as soon as a self-conscious style to target a kind of person rather than drive home a biblical truth is driving everything, I think that's when you run into trouble. And so, um, so the diversity issue is, is when we think a lot about our church and wonderfully in the past few years we've seen it become far more diverse, not just racially and culturally but also economically diverse and uh, culture. Was anybody at the Lord's Supper service where we were sending people off to, to mission trips in the summer and I think we had nine different countries people were going to and we asked people to pray for them in the language of that country. Was anybody at that, sir? We had all but one, I think. I think, we, no, I think it was, I think it was 10 countries represented people, where people were going and nine people prayed for those people in that language. The one we didn't have was British, uh, which is in the language, what's kind of a language. No, is it our church? Oh, did they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was amazing. It was just amazing. Yeah. We, we didn't plan it. Yeah. We, we just said, who can pray in Hindi? And the, the guy who prayed in Hindi, the guy who prayed in Hindi isn't from India. He, he's never spent a lot of time in India. He just has been learning Hindi because he wants to go. And he prayed for us in Hindi. It was just astounding. And so th there's a kind of diversity. We, we would love to see more of it. Um, and, and we're doing our best. But, but I think we're seeing it in some, some unusual ways generationally. I knew it was working in many powerful ways one day when I walked in our sanctuary. And so our, our small groups are, are as diverse as we can make them, 18 to 80, and all kinds of diversity in those groups, people who would never know each other or care to hang out otherwise. And I knew it was working one day when I knew this woman in our church um, her grandson, her three-year-old grandson, was just diagnosed with cancer. And it just had happened a couple days before. And I walked into the sanctuary, and this sophomore at Biola, who's in her small group, was laying hands on her, praying for this woman in her late 60s. 
And I just said, where would you ever see that in the church? Where they would even know each other. Never mind this college sophomore praying for this 68-year-old lady and laying hands on it. It was just this stark rarity that you see in the church. Because it's work, right? It's work for those two to love each other. It doesn't come real easily. They, they don't live in each other's circles that much. And so, so just trying to force that at every level. Okay, let me pray. Lord, thank you so much that you've revealed yourself to us uh, sufficiently and truly and um, personally. And Lord, you have given us quite a picture. And I pray you'd help us to know the ways we as individuals and as your people in general are neglecting aspects of this picture. And, and help us to, as best as we can, as finite creatures, see you as you are in all of your wonderful, um, comprehensive character. Lord, help us to understand each attribute informed by the others and you as this wonderful, um, interdependent uh, God where, where all your attributes are always functioning perfectly. Um, Lord, help us then to, to become more like you in this, where we understand what it means to mature in our attributes so that we can be patiently angry and, um, and humbly, graciously um, indignant. Lord, help us to know what it, it means to be more like you in these ways. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Take a break. See it <coughs> ten after, and then we'll we'll circle up and talk talk Piper. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.